Most people do not see God at work in their personal lives and therefore do not know how to join Him. This Divine Appointments podcast is to encourage you in your faith to open your eyes to seeing God's hand at work. My hope and prayer is that by hearing these stories, you too will engage where God is already working and discover God's mission for your life. Well, good morning. Uh, I have a very uh, exciting guest here today, or I'm actually in his home office. This is Dr. Tate Bigpen. He is a medical hematologist, oncologist, former chairman of the department at University of Mississippi Medical Center. Is that right? Did it's I say uh, it right? Di- div- division director. <laughs> division division director. in the Department of Medicine, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone who ever trained at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, myself included, uh, knows Dr. Tate Bigpen and what he, the giant that he is in medicine and oncology, but also he's a giant in his faith. And I've had the opportunity to see that at our church together. Mm -hmm. So he agreed to share uh, some of his story today. First, I'll read Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. Uh, This is my theme scripture for Divine Appointments podcast. That is, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his accomplishments among the nations, sing to him, make music to him, Tell about his miraculous deeds. Boast about his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and the strength that he gives. Seek his presence continually. Remember the miraculous deeds he performed, his mighty acts, and the judgments he decreed. So we're going to remember the miraculous deeds in Dr. Thupin's life today. Uh, first of all, I've, I've known you as really your, your sons. He's married to Miss Louisa for how many years have you been married? Oh goodness. Uh, 53 and a half years now. 53 and a half. And mm-hmm. they have five boys. Mm-hmm. And as a mother of three boys, I said, how in the world <laughs> did he manage five boys? <laughs> well, it was more like six children with me. <laughs> <laughs> he gave all credit to Miss Louisa. And our our his grandchildren and my children played sports together, and you would always see his wife as the grandmother in her minivan mm-hmm. taking kids all around Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, but uh, she's the woman behind the man, right? Absolutely. And how did y'all meet? We uh, met on a blind date, actually, uh, introduced uh, by a mutual friend, uh, David Guyton, who is the was the oldest son of uh, Arthur Guyton, the physiologist uh, that was at uh, the University Medical Center for years and years. Um, David, still a great friend, and I thank him very much for introducing me. That was the best thing he ever to did. what I think was the most wonderful woman on the face of the planet. <laughs> wow, that's so great. And I did a little research with daughters-in-law of yours, and they said that you were the most brilliant man to ever come out of Picayune, Mississippi. <laughs> well, it was a town of 4,000, okay? So <laughs> that was... <laughs> you, you graduated, you said your class was how many uh, students? We had 56 uh, students in the class, and uh, there are a, an, 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 an un, almost unbelievable number of uh, doctoral degrees that came out of that class, and including uh, three physicians, uh, uh, it, it was a very exceptional class, top to bottom, and uh, I, it was a great privilege to have been part of that peer group. I'll tell you that uh, there was a story about how how advanced you were. You were advanced in school because you were so ahead of your class, and that uh, when all the kids were in class together, you would finish early and then rush your friends up so that y'all could go outside and play. Is that true? I think that's probably was exaggerated a little bit. <laughs> More than a little bit. Oh, goodness. So then, so then you graduated from Picayune High School and went to Ole Miss. Correct. That's the shirt, uh, Ole Miss. <laughs> yeah, I, interestingly, uh, in this, to me, uh, life's been a sort of a series of doors that open when they're supposed to open. Mm-hmm. 
by the Lord. And uh, I was actually admitted, I applied to Tulane University, was accepted and was to start school at Tulane in September of that year. And in uh, May of that year, a gentleman by the name of George Street came to our home and offered me a carrier scholarship at Ole Miss, which at the time was the top ac academic scholarship that they gave out, I think, uh, eight or so a year. Wow. And uh, so it was literally a, almost a free ride uh, at, uh, at Ole Miss. So that uh, I uh, immediately accepted it. What made it a lot easier, too, is that I had been a dyed-in-the-wool Ole Miss fan since 1947 wow. in my first Ole Miss football game that I went to. I had a grandfather who was close friends with Johnny Vaught and uh, wow. uh, who uh, used to take me to all the uh, – all the games, uh, at the very least, the Tulane game every year in New Orleans. But uh, in addition to that, others as well. So you're you're a diehard rebel, huh? I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went on to medical school. What made you choose to go in to on to medical school? Well, actually, I it was a decision between uh, going to law school or going to medical school. My father was an attorney. Okay. Uh, but he told me that I really needed to go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually I sort of uh, gave in to that and uh, went to medical school. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you did it, had an interesting fellowship. Talk about that, going in, in the middle of well, medical school, going to Germany. Yeah, well, yeah I uh, uh, got a Rotary International Fellowship to spend a year in Munich, Germany at, uh, the, at the Ludwig Maximilians University in, 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 in Munich. So I took a year's leave of absence between the, between the freshman and sophomore years of medical school to go over there on that fellowship, managed to uh, rupture a spleen while I was there, ended up back here uh, with a misdiagnosis of acute leukemia, which was an interesting time. And uh, it's sort of sobering to uh, get diagnosed with acute leukemia. <laughs> right. Uh, turned out to be an, an error in diagnosis. Uh, and. Uh, but so, that had nothing to do with you doing oncology, it, right? It has or, nothing. It had <laughs> nothing to do with ultimately my going into the field of oncology. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then, what age did you co come to faith in Christ? You said you were really young. Uh, age six. I uh, I was very fortunate. Picayune uh, was a great place to grow up in that day and time. I had an incredibly good peer group. Uh, the First Baptist Church in Picayune, Mississippi, was outstanding. Uh, it had a great pastor, John Maddox, at the time, who was the son of a missionary in Brazil, a Baptist mission, son of a Baptist missionary in Brazil. Uh, so I was just in a milieu that uh, was a Christian milieu with a, a peer group that was an exceptional peer group in the high school there. And, uh, very, very fortunate. Uh, and you had a love of learning academically, but you carried that over into Bible study as well. Well, yeah, um, I, <clears throat> my, uh, my parents were very oriented toward uh, learning, reading, <clears throat> and uh, so I was taught that at an early age. I can take no credit in that. That's all my upbringing, and uh, I was just very, very fortunate. The Lord blessed me in the environment in which I was uh, born into. So um, back in the day, I didn't realize how new a specialty of oncology was. How did you come to, you, you came yeah. to hematology first? Yeah, well, I, in, in, uh, in going through residency, I went, went through various phases where I thought I wanted to be an endocrinologist or I thought I wanted to be a pulmonologist. Uh, all of that had largely to do with the... Uh, Kind of faculty I was around and, uh, and and how I viewed them, but when I got back uh, to uh, Jackson to finish residency here from Rochester, New York, uh, Francis Morrison had just come on faculty out there. Fran was a very charismatic uh, hematologist and convinced me that hematology was where I wanted to be. Um, again, having nothing to do with all of my experiences earlier. Um, I, uh, and when I started what was a hematology fellowship, uh, Fran was asked to uh, 
start an oncology program at the, at the, in the Department of Medicine at the university. At that time, all the oncology was handled in the clinical lab. Uh, it was a very early time in the development of uh, the management of cancer, uh, particularly in the internal medicine uh, area. Uh, and uh, so as a fellow in the division, I sort of had to deal with cancer. And as I told somebody one time, they said, why did you choose oncology? And I said, I didn't, it chose me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of uh, had to do it because uh, it was there to do and we needed to do it. And it um, turned out that it uh, became a very fascinating field about that time because that's when some of the major developments started to evolve uh, uh, in the uh, cancer area. Uh, one other thing, we the, the university joined the Southwest Oncology Group, which is one of the cancer clinical uh, cooperative research groups uh, managed by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, I ended up on a committee in that uh, called the Sarcoma Committee that, developed, that dealt with uh, sarcomas. And the chair of that committee was a guy named Jeff Gottlieb, who became also another mentor uh, in helping me learn how to do clinical investigation, how to develop a clinical trial properly, and what was required. Uh, so his influence was big in that regard. So really, you you said the boards were, for oncology were not even begun until 1973. That's right. The, and uh, then you were asked as a fellow, not even finished with your training, to create this oncology department. Well, yeah, well, Fran was. I mean, I, I was the fellow. You were tapped. Uh, yeah, I was, I was tapped as uh, a part of that uh, effort, yeah. Uh, and then uh, you t talk about Dr. Borno coming and dropping you. Well, when I, uh, when I was a senior medical student, uh, Dr. Richard Borno came to the university as head of gynecologic oncology. Uh, and uh, I guess I should add, too, one other thing that, he and, and several other major figures in the field of gynecologic oncology were responsible for establishing gynecologic oncology as probably the first of the oncology disciplines to have a formal training program. Uh, medical oncology was next, but uh, um, and Dick was a, a major part of that effort and became a major influence uh, of me and what I ultimately uh, ended up doing in oncology. Uh, so there were a, a host, it's, it's not just one mentor who guided me in this particular direction, it's a host of different people who had a lot of influence. And these are very good people you know, in the area that, uh, that I was very fortunate to come into contact with. And I had no idea, you know, gynecologic oncology, that you were so instrumental in that not only at UMC, University of Mississippi, but the whole country. And well, they, the, the first gynecologic oncology group, you were instrumental in yeah, bringing they, that together. It was interesting. Uh, in 1970, the gynecologic oncology group was formed. This was a group of, at that time, I think 10 or 11 institutions that agreed to go together and do clinical trials together so they could get answers faster. Uh, and uh, by 1975, uh, the National Cancer Institute had decided that it was not doing well and that they were going to get rid of the gynecologic oncology group. And they literally told uh, the new incoming chairman of the gynecologic oncology group, Dr. George Lewis from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that uh, they were going to phase it out. Uh, as a result, uh, the uh, statistical center and the statistician for the group were all pulled away uh, by the powers that be at Roswell Park in Buffalo. And they, they uh, hired as the group statistician uh, a young guy, John Blessing, who became the group statistician for what was, according to the National Cancer Institute, to be the dying throes of the gynecologic oncology group. And John was a very interesting person in that uh, he was very pragmatic, very innovative, and also for a statistician spoke English. Okay, um, excuse me, let me, I apologize. That's all right. The, uh, at any rate, um, John and I became friends, 
because we met at a gynecological oncology group meeting, which I was literally dragged to kicking and screaming by Dr. Borodo, okay? Uh, and we became friends, and uh, about that time, the National Cancer Institute told the gynecological oncology group that the only way they could survive was to appoint a medical oncologist as the chair of their major scientific committee. And here he is. <laughs> yeah. And there were only three medical oncologists involved in the group in those days, and uh, one of them just became chair of another group and couldn't do it. The other, I think, got off the ark with Noah because he was extremely <laughs> old and about to retire. So he wasn't eligible, so they were sort of stuck with a 32-year-old recent uh, fellowship uh, graduate. And uh, working together, John and I sort of drew up a, a totally different kind of structure for a cooperative group that was a more open forum in which everybody had proper input. And that became very successful. We were just blessed with the way things uh, turned out. Uh, uh, and... Uh, the gynecologic oncology group literally revolutionized uh, the field of gynecologic cancer over the next 35 years. Uh, took it from a point where the average survival for ovarian cancer was seven months to the point now where we uh, talk about 38% of people probably being cured, or at the very least long-term survivors of ovarian cancer. Uh, and uh, a number of other advances in other areas in the field. Uh, again, not not me doing it, that this this was a whole raft of people, literally hundreds of people from all over the world working together uh, in a group that eventually evolved, involved 441 hospitals and institutions from, from all over a the number world. of different countries around the world. Yeah. And Dr. Thupin helped organize that. <laughs> yeah, and, and the key word there is help. I didn't organize it myself. I, we had a lot of brilliant people having a lot of input into that, 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 that made it successful. We were just very fortunate that the Lord brought together a critical mass of, of the right people to, to, to mm -hmm. make it happen. And I asked him what his legacy was, and he probably, he said this probably was one of your biggest legacies was mm -hmm. this, the advances in this gynecologic oncology group yeah, I'd have to worldwide. Say that, I'd have to say that, that was the, yeah, that, the, the biggest single Thing. It's a thing that, that uh, and I hate to use the word pride because, but I, it's the thing that uh, I would look to as being the most significant thing that I ever was involved in. Not something I accomplished on my own, but something mm -hmm. that we accomplished together. And I ask how many, being a, an academician, how many papers he put, he said I, he has over 250 publications, but humbly says that this was because you really, it was a joint, a team It effort. was a large number of people working together. And it's not, we made sure that uh, publication credit uh, in the group was spread around. So different people got first author credit mm -hmm. uh, on papers. Uh, and for all of us, I think what we felt was that uh, it's not so much who gets the credit as the fact that the information and knowledge is out there to help people with these particular uh, diseases. Mm. So being an oncologist, you have uh, life and death issues with your patients all the time. Mm -hmm. And did you ever see really interventions that you knew were mm -hmm. completely supernatural that God had to intervene in treatments of patients you've had through the years? Well, in the oncology field, I think that's a common everyday occurrence. <laughs> the, uh, It'd be, it'd be hard to be an atheist oncologist. I'm sure there are some. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. There's, um, there's some things that happen in the course of treatment that you just can't explain um, that have to be a result of uh, the Lord's intervention in, in the thing. So we see that all the time. Can you tell us a few that you remember? <laughs> <laughs> well... Of course, I like the pregnant lady story. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> in uh, the early 1970s, it was believed that uh, chemotherapy agents uh, uh, would cause uh, irreparable and unmanageable birth defects and that uh, if someone was pregnant and got a cancer that had to be treated with uh, these drugs, that uh, uh, doing uh, an abortion was absolutely essential. Uh, we in... Uh, 1973 had a young lady who came in who was pregnant um, about month four if I remember correctly 
and uh, the recommendation, of course, came down. It was a standard recommendation today that she needed to have an abortion done before beginning treatment for her uh, leukemia. And uh, we disagreed and uh, treated her with an aggressive uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, combination. She went on to enter remission. She also uh, carried the pregnancy to term, and the child was later valedictorian of his high school graduating class. Um, the, uh, but uh, in addition, uh, that was 1973. She went into remission and passed away in 2011 of malignant hypertension, not yeah. cancer. Never had a recurrence wow. of her uh, of acute leukemia. Uh, and that's just one example of things that happen that you wouldn't expect, but 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 they do. And and now and nowadays, I don't think people regard an abortion as as essential uh, if in a pregnant woman who has to be treated for cancer. Now, admittedly, this particular patient was in the second trimester of pregnancy, mm -hmm. and that probably did make a difference because during the first trimester, there are all kind of developmental things going on where you could get an effect. Mm -hmm. So you just counseled her and... Went ahead and, and, and treated. Were, and were these chemo drugs, did, did they have known um, teratogenic birth defects? Oh, oh yes. Oh, causing yes. Oh, yes. drugs that, uh, and you just the combination of, gave her those uh, options? You know, the um, combination included cytosine arabinoside, uh, 6 thioguanine, and uh, cytoxin. Uh, and Oncolin as a part of the treatment, uh, and uh, at least a couple of those drugs uh, were potentially significant risk for uh, birth defects. The, 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 the fact that she was in the second trimester and the fact that uh, um, we were very careful with how things were managed um, Amazing. Yeah. contributed to that but it, it clearly was a miracle and I think there are other examples along the way of people who have had uh, responses that uh, I don't think you can explain by all a totally natural uh, you means. said the, the hepatoma talk, talk about the liver yeah we had a, <laughs> we had a, a one of the first patients I saw after I came on the faculty was a guy that uh, had a large liver cancer so large that his liver which normally would be felt at the edge of the rib cage, was felt down in his pelvis. Mm. Huge uh, liver. Uh, and we treated him with a combination that had been reported in a small study as possibly having activity. He comes back in four weeks later, and um, I can't feel his liver. We did a repeat scan on him, and the liver is now normal. So in four weeks, the liver cancer disappeared. That was a remission that lasted for a period of 14 months. Uh, now it wasn't a complete cure. He obviously later relapsed and died of his cancer, but uh, it uh, gave him 14 months, which he had to uh, see his family and do all those things that you know, like to do. And uh, so it was 14 months he wouldn't have had otherwise. And, and that was a miraculous response to that uh, combination of drugs. So what we see See that again. We see that all the time in the oncology field. It's one of the great things about the oncology field. <laughs> that to, I always told people that the, the, the two greatest things about the oncology field are that number one, you do see these great responses all the time. Number two, when the patient comes to you with a diagnosis of cancer, they have already concluded that they're going to die of their cancer. Mm -hmm. So that literally anything you do for them, they're very grateful. Mm -hmm. And if they get a great response, Oh, the, 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 it's, it's just magnificent. Mm. Uh, and I think that's probably more so in the cancer area than any other area. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say this is a caveat, though. that uh, If you look in the United States, if you look at what causes death in the United States, the uh, heart and cancer are always listed as a major true with stroke somewhat behind. Now, both heart and stroke involve blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very few cures of hardening of the arteries, mm -hmm. arteriosclerosis. Cancer, the uh, estimated uh, cure rate by the National Cancer Institute now overall is 50%. It's substantially higher than a cure in the cardiovascular uh, area. 
Mm. So that um, I always thought that cancer probably had more of a dark reputation than it deserved, okay? In, in light of everything we have that we can do to help these right. patients now. Mm. And we talked about how even modern studies, academic journals are showing that prayer and your faith yeah. can really impact uh, your health and cure rates. I think, I think one of the biggest problems with our society today is that segments of the society have pushed hard to have prayer taken out of the public square. Mm. That's why, as we were talking earlier, I... <laughs> I find it very gratifying that a week and a half ago, we saw prayer return prominently to the public square mm -hmm. when you saw two football teams kneeling in prayer on an NFL playing field, mm -hmm. praying for the recovery of one of the players who had literally died on the field and been resuscitated. Right. And you've seen prayers go out from groups that previously might have been fighting prayer in the public square uh, prior to that. It, it was a magnificent sight. It really was. And a humbling, like when no one, when nothing else is available, yeah. that's when everyone takes a knee that's right. and bows the head. <laughs> so uh, on, that, on that note, when through the, all your years, um, of doing all these amazing things in medicine, you were also teaching the Bible and having Bible study and Sunday school class. Um, what what did you what what did you want to give in that realm? I think uh, we got involved in teaching because we had uh, some people who came to us and said they wanted a class that really looked in depth at Scripture. Uh, my concept of uh, teaching scripture is that it must be taught in context in order to be understood fully. Mm. And that to me means that the best way to approach it would be to take a book at a time in the Bible and go through that book and try to understand it in the context in which it was written. Uh, and that's the basis on which we've uh, taught this Sunday school class the last uh, 15, 16, 17 years or so. Um, um, I, I, as I tell the people in the class, I get a lot more out of it than they do because preparing the lesson makes me do something that I might find excuses not to do if, mm -hmm. if I didn't have that obligation. Um, I think that's something else that the Lord has given me to make me do the study that I need to do. <laughs> And so it's it's been most enjoyable. And and they're um, a whole group now of young couples, or older younger couples that are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we sit in his home office, and I'm look to his bookshelves, and there are, he's talking about a book at a time, and there are all these commentaries on books, Exodus, yeah. Genesis, uh, First Kings. I see First Kings up there. <laughs> yeah. We. Uh, Books and books of uh, commentaries and talking yeah. about taking it in context, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, trying to go into more in depth. I think the one thing we've tried to do is not to uh, avoid controversial areas, but to talk about controversial areas. I mean, it's an area where I certainly don't have all the answers. Nobody does right now for sure. But I think it's important as Christians that we look at those areas that... Uh, may have controversy attached and come to the best understanding we can of those areas that the more we know about the Bible, the more we know about the ways of the Lord, the more likely we are to stand steadfast in our faith. Mm. Amen. And I, I'm, I, I know that in your practice, you brought faith into what you did. It was a part of your practice at work every day. Yeah, in fact, as you uh, went along every day, the university uh, used to have a very active chaplaincy program. They do, they they have a chaplaincy program now. It's not as active as it was at that time. This was in the uh, late seventies and through the early eight, early eighties to about nineteen eighty seven. Uh, there was a guy named Jim Travis who was a hospital chaplain out there, 
and another individual that worked with him, Don Dinsmore. Uh, Jim was Baptist, uh, Dinsmore was, I think, Methodist. Mm -hmm. And we actually integrated them into the oncology uh, fellowship program and uh, had them work with the f fellows in uh, managing the patient's spiritual side of things and how they handled mm -hmm. what they were having to go through. Uh, I thought that was very important. Uh, unfortunately, funding cutbacks in 1987-88 seriously uh, damaged the uh, chaplaincy program at the university. It's, 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 I think I'm still not back up to where it was, mm -hmm. but uh, but that was a wonderful time when uh, we had the direct working relationship. I'm sure yeah. that helped patients and staff as well. Right? Well, and fellows. I mean, fellows. They, they got exposed mm -hmm. to the importance of that aspect of things early. That's great. Mm -hmm. So in closing, I ask uh, the man who's taught in-depth Bible study for years what his favorite scripture is. <laughs> well, as, as, as we were discussing, um, that was a hard I, don't, question. I, don't, I don't like <laughs> pulling scriptures out in isolation and quoting them as supposedly meaning something unless you understand them in context. But I do think there's one scripture in the Bible that can be pulled out of context and still understood and it means everything. And that's John 3.16. And, and I know that everybody says John 3.16, but truly that's, the I had to pick verse. one verse, that's it. Uh, because I think it summarizes exactly what we need to know. And what is that? Is that Jesus Christ is our means to salvation and to reconciliation, to re our justification with God. Mm. Uh, and uh, without his willingness to sacrifice and die on the cross for our sins, we wouldn't have that access now. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sigatine, and I really appreciate you. you sharing today. Thanks so much for watching this episode. Now you engage where God is at work. Please make sure to like and subscribe so you will be notified of future episodes.